Blessed Baptist Church on Witcher Creek. It's preaching time with Pastor Randy Wilson. I start reading today in verse number 7. 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 7. I like to hear pages rattle, but I don't like to hear them rattle too long. Are you there? Yes. Smile at me and say, I'm there, preacher. I'm there, preacher. Okay. Lie to me if you're not there. Say, I'm there. <laughs> Look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervor and heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasten unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you today for the privilege to pray and preach. Thank you, God, for uh, the opportunity to come to church and Assemble ourselves together with the uh, brethren and worship you. Father, I pray that you'd help us now as we go to preach your word. Give us grace. Help us to be clear and help people to understand what we say. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this isn't the only scripture, but this is one of the main scriptures that testifies that this world is not going to be here forever. Right. We'd think as we go along in, in life, we'd think that, uh, you know, everything's going on like it is, but one day like a thief in the night, yeah. God will just show up and, and in that moment's time, everything will be changed. There is going on a nuclear type disaster. Is that what I'm seeing there? Where the, where the heavens will pass away, and the earth and everything in it will be melted and dissolved. Now we're, today we're in uh, negotiations with Iran. And some people think that, that man is the one that's going to be in charge of destroying the world. I'm not worried about that at all. Amen. But the world will be destroyed. Amen. But here, in, uh, if I can show you this in dealing with Iran, I want to give you the word tequila. Not tequila. Tequila is a different word altogether. That's a Mexican whiskey that you're not supposed to know nothing about, preacher. But tequila is a Muslim word that, and a doctrine in their scripture that states that it's legal for them to lie to you. That there's no problem with them lying to you. Joe Manchin has got on his website the, the terms of the agreement with Iran. And what evidently Mr. Manchin doesn't understand is, it's not worth the paper it's written on. 
because it's perfectly legitimate for them to lie to you. They're not like we are. It, I mean, when we lie to people, we think, man, what kind of a sorry sight. But they're proud of it that those Americans were dumb enough to believe that we were going to stop our nuclear program just because we made an alliance with them. To key it, tremendously successful negotiating tool, wouldn't you say? I mean, if I was told everybody in here, I'd go give you a million dollars tomorrow. If you just give me a million today, y'all take up a collection to get it for me. But the truth of the matter is, you cannot believe what they tell you. Nobody in the Middle East can you believe what they tell you because of that, that lie. Well, here's a lie that's promised, promoted everywhere, and you know it is. Even the President of the United States says that Islam is a religion of peace. That's a lie. The only way you can have peace is to become a Muslim. But they'll lie to you and say, we're wanting peace. Lie number two is the, the nuclear deal uh, uh, it, that they intention on keeping. They have no intention of keeping it. Uh, so I would say turn it down. Of course, I'm not a negotiator. But uh, here's, a, here's a little good news. God's not dependent on Muslims to tear up the world when he gets ready to tear it up. The uh, Atomic Energy Commission and the the military strategists tell us that uh, it's, it's so terrible for us to even think about nuclear war. They say they could drop one bomb on New York City and put the whole state on fire. Actually, from Maine to Virginia would be annihilated with just one nuclear bomb. They could drop a bomb on New Orleans and 22,000 miles of uh, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee would all be destroyed. If they'd put one, they tell me this, if they would just drop one in the Pacific Ocean, there would be a tsunami that would reach clear to Kansas. I mean, I understand their fear uh, of not having a nuclear weapon. And I don't know that that's all true. That's just what they tell you. But I do know that the world is not going to stand forever and one day God Himself is going to be the author of its destruction. Why He doesn't do that? Why He doesn't do that already? I can show you very simply in verse number 9. The reason He doesn't blow the world up right now is because God is long-suffering and not willing that any should perish. He's not slack on His promise. The thing that holds off the annihilation is that God wants people to repent. People who laugh at Him, people who want to outlaw Him, and yet God desires that they would repent. Over in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 21, He's talking to an apostate church. He's not talking to the world, but he's talking to an apostate church. And just before he passes judgment on the church of Thyatira, he says, I gave her space to repent. I gave her time. I waited. I wanted her to. But she would not repent. And judgment eventually fell. Man misinterprets that space that God gives. Man says, well... uh, Sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, so I just get away with it. They don't realize that it's the goodness of God that gives you opportunity and leads you to repentance. We've, we've got our heart fully set in this country to do evil. And God is long-suffering, but make no mistake, the day will come when God will see to it. Like a thief in the night, unexpected unanticipated, unprepared for. He said the elements will melt with a fervent heat. The earth and the works thereof will be burned up. Elements, verse number 10. That's the, the and I, you've got to excuse my science, I'm not a scientist. Uh, that's the particles that make up matter. The elements. Like the letters of the alphabet. You take A to Z, 
They make up our alphabet. All of the words that are in our language are some combination of that alphabet. Am I making sense? There are 118 elements, if I'm right in that. Some of you physicists can help me with that. But I think there are 118 elements and they make up everything that is. Whatever they are, their combination is what makes everything that is. But this says that the elements will melt. In verse number 11, it said the things of the earth will be dissolved. And looking at that, the scholars tell me that that, that word dissolved has the, the, uh, the meaning of coming untied. That something is tied together. We do not know what holds things together. I mean, the scientists keep looking with their microscopes and microscopes, and as they keep looking, it seems like when they get down to the bottom of it, doesn't nothing hold it together. But the Bible teaches us that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, and it's the Word of God that holds us together. All God has got to do is say, turn them loose, loose them and let them go like he did Lazarus. All he's got to do is say, untie and they'll fall apart because God only holds them together. The energy stored in the atom will be turned loose. Look at verse number 10. It said the heavens will melt with a, or pass away with a great noise. Now here's an interesting question. How could a, a first century fisherman be so accurate in describing a nuclear blast? What would a Peter, who never did anything but fish all his life, how could he know about a nuclear explosion? I'm talking, we're not talking 1800 or 1500. We're talking about in the very first century this was written down that God is going to see to it that the heavens pass away with a great noise. Very accurately described the unhitching, if you will, of the eradication of the creation as you look around it. Oh, God is once supposed to repent. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 He's speaking of the final judgment when it said, I saw a great white throne from before whose face the heaven and the earth fled away. Now if we put this thing in particular to where it actually belongs, whenever Satan is loosed from his prison for that little season and goes out to deceive the nations of the world after the millennial, but that for its purpose, the Bible said just, to, just in, uh, uh, as soon as he encompasses the city, Fire falls from heaven, destroys. So we're talking then about the final destruction when God gets rid of everything there is and builds a new heaven and a new earth. That day is approaching. Every morning when we get up and look out at the sunshine, we're one day closer to the day that the world will be destroyed. And if the world would stand another thousand years, it said one day... Is a thousand years, a thousand years. If it was to stand another thousand years, you're not going to stand. I'm not going to stand another thousand years. I don't know how long I'm 70 years old. I don't know how, you are, how old you are, but I know that's all God promised. So, I mean, I love to check out any day. What, what manner of person ought we to be? Verse 11, Peter asked that. What manner of person should we be knowing these things are going to come. Well, in verse 13, we should be a kind of a person that according to His promise has looked for a new heaven and a new earth. We don't have to be all worried and discouraged and scared because of what's going on in the Middle East. But the Apostle John saw massive scale destruction, but he said, I saw beyond that, and I saw their good news, children. There's a day coming when the lamb and the wolf will lay down together. He saw the powers of Antichrist as they, as they rose and a, a promise of prosperity and, and a fulfillment of poverty. He saw a promise of peace and a fulfillment of war. He saw a, a famine and, 
and he saw the pale horse and his rider and the, the death that followed. John saw the horrible conditions that, that man in tandem with Satan will produce in this world. And believe you, man, we are right in the process right now of producing of the wickedest, horrible generation that America has ever known. People don't even have a clue. I talked to a young man last night that was shacked up with a girl, and he said, why do I need a piece of paper? I said, you don't need a piece of paper. What you need is a commitment. Oh, we're committed. No, you're not. If you was committed, you'd want to do right by her. Hey, Amen. You don't want to do right by her. I, I know what you want. Yeah, just like all of these other young people. You haven't got to see. You think you're a dog. You think you're supposed to live like a dog. Think you're supposed to live like a monkey. And I know who we got, I know who we got to blame for that. A public education system uh, that teaches us that we came from monkeys and didn't have God because we didn't uh, retain God in our knowledge. That's how we're getting in this shape. And it's getting worse and worse. But uh, the Antichrist will come and, and he will produce that uh, uh, war and, and he'll produce that famine and he'll produce death. Uh, but in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20, after all that was over, John looked up and said, Even so, come Lord Jesus. Right. He did not see the Lord's coming as something to break up a Christian's party. Right. Amen. He saw it as a rescue from an awful shambles that man's made out of this world. What, uh, if the world is going to be destroyed, what kind of persons ought we to be? Well, let me say, number two, that we ought to be a kind of person that makes sure that we are, have our calling and election settled with Jesus. We've got so many people don't know whether they're saved or not. They think it's up to them. They think if they're in a foot race with the devil to the pearly gates, and if they happen to outrun him, uh, uh, then they'll make it in. They think if their good works outweighs their bad works, then they'll make it in. We need to get it settled uh, uh, whether we're saved or whether we're lost. The Bible said in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way we can have peace with God is through Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 9, being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath. That wrath that's fallen will be saved from wrath through Jesus. What I'm saying is while the long-suffering of God is going on in this world, He's given you opportunity to get peace with God and be spared the wrath that's fallen on this world. Amen. The Bible said being justified by His blood, be saved from wrath through Him. And then I think, uh, and said, be found in Him without, without spot. A spot is a is a uh, identifying mark. Would you would you agree with that? I mean, if you got a spot in something, uh, it identifies a leopard that he's got spots. But lepers had spots too. And whenever you go to look about the Bible, and you first looking about anything with spots, you find out that that a leper's got spots. And he was to come to the priest. And the priest would examine that spot. And when he examined that spot, he was looking for one thing. Is that spot temporary or is that spot permanent? Amen. If it's temporary, hallelujah. Well, I get ready to shout up here. I mean, I know Christians have blemishes and spots in them. But thank God they're temporary. We do not, as God's people, we do not have a permanent spot because our spot of sin was washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. The spot was inspected. And it, you know, whether it was permanent or temporary. And a lot of people marked with spots. Watch out on Ash Wednesday. Whatever that means. Some dude will come in thinking he's religious that day. He'll have a big black spot right in front of his... What is that? What is that trying to say? I'm marked. I'm a spotted dude. That's what it's trying to say. And then in, in that scripture over there, is, uh, uh, in Ephesians, as it's talking about spots, and, and it said wrinkles. What causes wrinkles? 
Did you ever see them dogs that's all wrinkled up in their face? <laughs> I, I, I think they call wrinkled girls dogs. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Don't, don't throw rocks at me. Uh, 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 but, but wrinkles, what, are you listening? Wrinkles are caused by too much flesh. <laughs> it lost its elasticity. Amen. And what used to be stretched out there looking good, amen, it lost that ability and it just all crinkles up because you got too much flesh. What you need is to get a facelift, amen. I think some of them got a facelift that every time they... Blink their eyes, their kneecaps moves up and down. But, but, but what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that, that we as the church of God, because we have that peace with the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that we've got, the spots and the blemishes, He'll present us spotless to the Father. We will not, amen, we will not, our wrinkles and spots are only temporary. I mean, you look up here and see an old gray-headed preacher, but thank God when I get to heaven, I'm not going to be an old gray-headed preacher. Amen. I'm going to be just the right size. You'll still recognize it's me, but I'm going to be just the right size, just what I ought to be. Did you ever wonder how we can identify with that? I mean, you know, here's, uh, here's somebody that... Those people here never saw me black-headed. I used to be. Those people here that never saw me, I wasn't fat. Amen. Be quiet, I'm preaching. I'll let you have your opportunity. There are people that never saw me without glasses. Wow, where'd y'all go? But in that day, uh, unless fat's where it's at, I won't be fat. In that day when the Lord Jesus comes and gathers His people, I won't be gray-headed, I won't have arthritis, my back won't hurt, amen, my toes won't hurt, I won't have ingrown nothing, everything will be spotless, I'll be just like the Lord Jesus Christ because I'll see Him as He is. So why should I worry about the world blowing up whenever I got a better promise? Amen. We're looking beyond the blowing up of this world Amen. and we're looking uh, to a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And then I think, does it say here blameless? What, what manner, uh, verse number 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot, and blameless. Now what does blameless mean, preacher? Blameless means you got it taken care of. It doesn't mean that you don't sin. And I'm not of the idea you have to sin every day. I mean, that's just the excuse people use. But you do sin. I'm not saying how often. And living in this world is like Peter walking on water. You can walk just as long as you got your eyes on Jesus. Whenever you take your eyes off of Jesus, you'll sink. If you can keep your eyes on Jesus for 20 years, you can walk without sinning for 20 years. But just as quick as you take your eyes off of Him, if it's 15 seconds, you'll start down. Amen. So, so in order to be blameless, look in the book of Luke chapter 1 here for just a minute. Luke chapter 1. Look at verse 5. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abai, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now how 
Did they walk in the commandments of God blameless? Very simple. God made provision that whenever they sinned, they brought the sacrifice. You see what I'm talking about? And when they brought that sacrifice in, they confessed their sins over that sacrifice and unloaded their sins on that sacrifice. When they come out, they were innocent and the sacrifice had to die. Now, doesn't the Bible say that? I'm not trying to make up something. Doesn't the Bible say if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins? How can He be faithful uh, to forgive us simply because He's God? But how can He be just? He can only be just because the penalty has got to be paid. And the penalty was paid by Jesus. So whenever you fall on your face, and you will fall on your face, you get up and confess your sin to God and you'll go on and you won't have any blame. You see, people think about our, think about our uh, position at the judgment seat of Christ having to pay for our sins. Jesus paid for our sins. You never have to pay for your sin. Jesus paid for your sins. There's no double jeopardy. There's no double payment. Jesus paid. You will pay. You will pay for your work. You will suffer loss or you will get gain. But thank God, Jesus took my sins in His body. Hallelujah on the tree. Verse 15. God's long suffering is a good thing. And that good thing leads us to repentance. Let's look back here at... at, uh, Peter again. Verse 15. And account the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Account that God's long suffering is an opportunity for you to have salvation. Do you see what I'm saying here? Account that, account that because God didn't smack you down doesn't mean that He won't smack you down. But it does mean that He's gave you a space to get right with Him. It is our prayer that we would not abuse the grace of God. What I've just explained to you, uh, we would not trample it under our feet. We would not think, well, I can just go on and sin with a high hand because Jesus paid for it. It's our prayer that we'd understand that God's long suffering is to give us opportunity to get right with Him. Let's bow for prayer. If I have opportunity today to get right with the Lord Jesus Christ, then would you agree with me that now is the accepted time? Would you agree with me that while He's calling, we ought to respond?